Good evening, everyone. The time is 6.32. We are going to go ahead and get started with our <clears throat> April 16th called meeting. Where's my agenda? Okay. All right, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, Superintendent Hooker, would you please do roll call? Yes, Madam Chair. Ms. Heidi Hensley. Ms. Claudia Butts. Here. Ms. Linda Davis. Here. Dr. Patricia Yeager. Here. Mr. Tim Denson. Here. Dr. Mombi Anderson. Here. Dr. Lakeisha Gant. Here. Ms. Nicole Hull. And Mr. Mark Evans. Thank you, Dr. Hooker. We will now move forward to item number three to amend or adopt the agenda as presented. I make a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Second. All right, motion made by Mr. Denson and seconded by Dr. Yeager. All in favor? Aye. Wonderful. That motion has been approved. We will now move forward to item number four, FY25 budget presentation. Mr. Greiner, would you like to go ahead and begin? Oh, there we go. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, I have the privilege of presenting the uh, initial look at the FY 2025 budget this evening. Um, of course, would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge it's definitely not a one-person show. There's a lot of hard work that goes into getting to this point. Um, Dr. Hooker, executive cabinet, our human resources staff, um, Jennifer Fraser, who's our director of budgets, and then also um, our school leaders were amazing through the allotment process. It's kind of neat to watch them work their magic with the allotments they have and trying to figure out what the best needs are within their own buildings and that flexibility we give them there. So, and again, of course, the, the Board of Education tonight as y'all get kind of the first look at the, the budget and as we go forward in the next few months. So, it's always, told Dr. Hooker the other day, this is an exciting time for me. He kind of looked at me funny, but <laughs> I love this, this work every year because I think it's, it's such a collaborative um, effort to try to get to a point where we have a budget that everybody feels comfortable with going into the next school year. So, so with that, we'll, we'll start. Um, I will start out by saying we have a lot of unknowns still at this point. Hopefully we'll have some of those cleared up by May uh, 9th when y'all have the tentative budget to approve. Mostly on the revenue side, we just still, but we'll talk through that. Just the unknowns are on that side right now. <clears throat> so um, this is the agenda for the evening. Uh, we'll review the budget as of today. Um, again, it's still tweaking a little bit on the expenditure side. And of course, there's some items for consideration tonight that we'll talk through. And then uh, as we continue to adjust the revenue projections, um, both on the property tax side and our uh, quality basic education from the state. Um, and then we'll review the next steps at the end, kind of where we're, where we're headed from here, kind of a roadmap. <clears throat> what to start with, what I think every budget needs to start with is our strategic plan that we just completed. Um, recently, um, our mission statement, we create educational journeys that empower all students to fulfill their potential. Our vision to be a high performing school district that ensures all students can access um, opportunities and positively contribute to their communities and then our goals. Uh, the three goals, thriving students, optimized talent, and connected culture. And I think the budget definitely has to be driven by the, the mission, the vision, and our goals. <clears throat> so these are the FY 2025 state budget changes that passed through the legislative session that was just completed a few weeks ago. Uh, the last step is Governor Kemp signing through. I don't foresee any changes in any of these. Um, so there is a salary increase for all certified personnel of $2,500. <clears throat> There's an increase in the pupil transportation allotment. Um, that area, as we mentioned before, has been one of the areas that has not been funded well by the state in the past. Uh, we roughly get about 1.3 million for transportation. It cost us a little over 10, nine to 10 million to run transportation for the school district this size. <clears throat> so we're, we're encouraged that the state recognize that this year. We don't know what that increase is gonna be completely yet. We hopefully will find that out in the next week or so, um, what that increase looks like. School security grant of 45,000 per school. Uh, there's indications this may be a continuation. We've had this the last couple years, but it was like a one-time grant. Um, I read a lot during the legislative session. They wanna make this a permanent fixture going forward. We're hopeful we'll be able to use some of that to cover some of our school security 
um, personnel costs, which we have not been able to do in the past. Uh, we've been able to, you know, do a lot of upgrades, strategics, and some other things that have been mentioned recently. Um, but again, we would love it if we can cover personnel out of that. <clears throat> Certified health insurance. This was kind of a it was not supposed to happen, but it did. <laughs> They raised certified health insurance for FY24 to 1,580 per member per month. We thought that was gonna be the ceiling. They raised the ceiling again this year. Now it's 1,760. We get a lot of that back through the, uh, the QBE funding formula. Uh, where it does hurt us a little bit more is on our federal grant side because we don't get any funding for it on that side. So we're kind of having to work through that, which eventually trickles over to the general fund if we have to move positions over that aren't able to be funded through our federal funds so <clears throat> uh, classified health insurance again this was supposed to go up in FY 25 but again they threw us a curveball at the last minute it was supposed to go up to 1445 per member they upped that to 1580 per member so it's about a eight to nine hundred thousand dollar difference for us just in that small change um, going you know up another 800 or so a year <clears throat> The TRS match, which is what the school district contributes for all of our employees that are TRS eligible. So that goes, is going from 19.98 to 20.78. Again, we get, on the certified side, we get that back mostly through QBE on the 80 classified employees, which are in TRS, which is a pretty good number. We do not, and that all has to come from local funds or property taxes mostly. So. <clears throat> and we'll talk through the impact of these changes uh, shortly. <clears throat> So the first thing I want to do is look at the FY 2025 revenue projections. Again, they're projections at this point. We don't have solid numbers from the tax digest. I did talk to Kurt Dunnigan last week, who's our tax assessor and does a great job at getting us information timely. Um, they're in the process of wrapping up, hopefully by the end of this month, normally before the end of the month. He said by April 30th, we should have solid numbers. Though. <clears throat> so right now we're looking at an 8% estimated growth is what he told me. Um, 2% of that is new growth, which means new construction that wasn't previously on the digest in 2024. <clears throat> and then 6% would be reassessment values where current property is going up. Keep it in mind, last year this number was between 15 and 17%. So that's a pretty drastic. And when we start looking at where we're at budget summary wise, you'll start to see the impact there. <clears throat> 1% uh, delinquency, uh, Tony Meadow, our tax commissioner, does a tremendous job collecting property taxes. Um, that is a great delinquency percentage. Um, she's collecting about roughly 99%. Uh, we do pay 2.5% for that collection, which is recognized statewide as a 2.5%. Uh, it's not necessarily said in there, but most it's kind of implied that 25 and that's what the districts pay the tax commissioners, 2.5%. And again, it's worth it because, I mean, we're collecting 99%, so, I mean, it's definitely worth it. Uh, we budgeted 650,000 for delinquent payments, which is kind of an average of what we typically run between six and 700,000. <clears> right now, it has, a, I left the millage rate the same. We'll talk about that a little bit later at 18.8 .8 mills, which is where we're currently at. So that would bring in, based on these factors, an estimated amount of a little over 133 million. Next, we'll, <clears throat> you can see this is just the net tax digest per mill. Uh, the orange, of course, is um, projected. We, one mill would bring in about 7.3 million based on the current estimate. Uh, last year, we were at about 6.8 mil, um, million per mill. <clears throat> Again, just a graphic representation of the millage rate. Uh, 2022, we were at 20 mills, which is the most allowed. Uh, 2023, the, the board decided to lower that to 18.8, .8, and that's where we're currently at. All right. Hold on, I think I skipped my fan. No, I actually didn't. All right. Um, so next, we'll look at state revenues, or a quality basic education, or QBE, as we'll refer to it through the rest of the presentation. Uh, Dr. Blankenship actually read across this video. It's about four or five years old, but I think it does a great job explaining how we do get state funding. So um, it's about a four to five minute video put out by the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, as I said, back in 2019. So I'm gonna get Lisa to play that. I just thought it would be kind of good to have a refresher on how QBE works in the state of Georgia. The 
decade rule of law that dictates how the state of Georgia disperses money to schools sits at the heart of most education policy discussions in the state. This video will answer the question, how does Georgia fund schools? Georgia's public schools are funded through a law passed in 1985 called the Quality Basic Education Act, or QBE. At its most basic, QBE takes the total number of students and uses that number to decide how much to pay out for school employee salaries, known as direct instructional costs and indirect costs, and other expenses needed to run a school, known as categorical grants. Before sending that amount down to each district, QBE subtracts out what the state thinks each district should be paying on its own, called local fair share. We'll talk through each of those buckets here, but first it's key to understand how QBE counts students. Twice a year, every school in the state counts the number of students present and notes what classes the students are in. Think general ed, gifted, or special education. These programs are funded differently based on things like what the state believes the appropriate class size should be. To account for students in different programs, the state divides up the day, then combines the pieces based on the programs they're in. The result is titled Full-Time Equivalent Students, or FTEs. By counting FTEs, the state can find out how many teachers need to be paid. Teacher salaries make up the bulk of the first bucket in the QBE formula, direct instructional costs. Each year, Georgia's General Assembly comes up with a base dollar amount to fund for each student. In 2019, it was $2,620.77. Every program that the state of Georgia pays for is given a weight. When QBE was created, it was decided that general education high school students were the least expensive to educate and assigned them a weight of one. Middle school, by comparison, is weighted slightly higher. At its most basic, if you had 100 high schoolers and 100 middle schoolers, after multiplying by each of the weights and the base amount, the middle school would be given just under $300,000, while the high school would get $262,000. Once school systems replicate this process for each program, the final dollar amount is how much each should be given for direct instructional costs. The next bucket is indirect costs. These are things that affect the students but aren't the classroom teachers. Think libraries, school maintenance, and salaries for principals. The funds for these positions are tied to the number of schools within the system and the number of FTEs in those schools. Here's what this looks like in practice for Fayette County in the 2018-2019 school year. You can see the calculation for direct instructional costs and indirect costs. At the bottom of these two buckets is the QBE formula earnings. Although the state says that Fayette County Public Schools need $128 million for these costs, this is not the amount the district will receive. To understand why, it's important to look back over 30 years. Before QBE, it was local taxes, not state money, that paid the most for schools. When QBE was being created, there was a fear that some local districts would just stop paying for schools altogether and make the state pay for everything. So lawmakers built in the requirement that each school system taxes their district five mills or $5 for every $1,000 of property value. This is known as local fair share, or required local effort, or five mil share. It's got a lot of names. So before the state sends down all the dollars needed to run a school system, it deducts the local fair share. After the calculation of direct and indirect educational costs and the subtraction of the local fair share, the state provides the fourth bucket, categorical grants. These grants are for services such as paying school nurses or sparsity, which would help smaller districts pay for overhead fixed costs like air conditioning. School bus transportation is also funded through categorical grants, although the state has paid a significantly lower percentage of the cost since 1991, when it paid over half. Equalization grants are also in this bucket. The state provides this money to districts that have less ability to raise money through property taxes. Even though every district has to tax five mills for education, there is nothing stopping them from taxing more. Equalization grants are given to districts with a lower tax base to ensure that all districts can provide a basic public education. There's much more to QBE, but that's the basics for how Georgia funds schools. The Quality Basic Education Act was ahead of its time, but that was a long time ago. By reference, you're watching an online video about a formula that was written when less than 10% of all houses in the U.S. even had a computer. The same basic formula was dictated where over $9.6 billion went in 2019. To learn more about where those billions of dollars came from, as well as where they're going, head to gbpi.org. Right. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. I just thought that was kind of, we actually did that at our aspiring leaders training we did recently. 
And I, again, Dr. Blankenship was, I'm glad she was able to find that. And um, I just think it does a really good job um, explaining. Um, most of that has not changed. Again, the formulas, 1985, as I always like to point out. Um, the pupil transportation, you know, you saw 14% basically the state. And that's what they're trying to increase this year. I think the goal was to get it above 50% again this year. So we're hopeful that we're, we're headed in the right direction there. Um, Again, there's one more bucket we get that wasn't around. I'm trying to think in 2019, I guess it was. We do get a charter system allotment as well, since we are a charter system. So that's about 1.3 million each year. That's based on an FTE formula. Um, so we also, I think it's about 100, it's a little over 100, 110 per FTE we get for being a charter system. So we also do get that. That's one bucket that was not. We do not receive equalization. Our, our tax base is too large to receive equalization. So we do not, that's based on um, taxable wealth per FTE. And we unfortunately, we don't, we do not, well, we have a large enough tax base, so that's good, but we don't receive equalization. Um, and we'll talk about local five mil share shortly. Um, so this is the, the projections for QBE. We typically, we would have had the allotment sheet last week. I think the state kind of threw the Department of Education a little bit of a curveball with some of the pupil transportation I just mentioned. So I think they're still, my, my guidance I got last week is they're still working on allotment sheet. So we're hopeful by the end of this week, there's no guarantee. By May 9th, we will have an allotment sheet, so we won't be guessing at QB. And I think we've, we've got a pretty solid number, but I would feel a lot more comfortable if I had the allotment sheet in my hand. Um, so this is built on our FTE, um, 12,000, a uh, little over 12,000, 12,008. Uh, which is about a 1.02% increase over FY 2024. So previous years, we had actually been declining a little bit, so it's good to see that positive trend again. So we're moving back, you know, back up in that category. Uh, no austerity, which is where the state would take funding away. Um, we're still in, you know, great shape um, at the state level. I don't foresee that happening anytime soon. Uh, again, the TRS employer contribution, we talked about that, the $2,500 salary increase. Local five, five mil share. I need to get back and add mil in there, sorry. But it's, it's, so it is the five mil withholding. Uh, last year we had 26.8 million that was deducted from our QBE earnings. Anticipate that being around 28.6 million. Um, the thing with the local five mil shares, it's based on a couple of digests. Like we're, we're gonna look at the 2024 digest this year. This is based on 2022. It runs two years in arrears. So, Unfortunately, this is going to hit us harder each year because our tax digest has had the biggest increase the last couple of years. We were at 10 percent for a couple of years, 15 to 17 last year. So we haven't seen the worst of this increase in the local five mil share. So that's going to kind of be something to think about as we move forward in FY 26 and then 27 as well. Uh, the state health benefit increase for certified employees we talked about. So the net budgeted QBE is, I've got it estimated to be 85.6 million at this point. So then we'll see, I think the next slide, we have a comparison of um, last year, FY24 down at the bottom, 80.4. This year we'll be at 85.6, I project somewhere around there. So about a $5.2 million increase in QBE. Um, Again, the local fair share piece. Um, state categorical grants is kind of what I'm estimating for transportation. I hope we get somewhere in the neighborhood of an additional 800,000. Again, that's kind of my best guess at this point. So that number may end up changing. Uh, the QBE formula earnings is what they just talked about in the video about direct instru instruction. The operating is those are the indirect costs they mentioned. So that's the, the breakdown there. So this is what our total estimated revenues right now um, look like for FY25. About an $11 million increase in property taxes, about a 5.2 million in QBE. Other sales tax revenue is the recording transfer fees when property exchanges hands. We've seen a, neg a, a downward trend in that. Um, I think this year we're gonna end up around 1.2 million. It was probably budgeted a little too high in FY24. Um, I'm going to be conservative in FY25 and say it's going to be about 1.2 million. That's kind of our checks have been running about 100,000 a month for for that. We did have a bigger check last month, so maybe it's headed back up. I know springtime is when a lot of transactions start happening, so we may see an upward trend in that. Title ad valorum tax is the old where we had the birthday tax on vehicles. This is what replaced that. We always thought this would eventually decrease at some point. It continues to increase each year. So I know when the state came out with that, 
there was supposed to be this curve where it increased and eventually would decrease. So um, we'll, we'll take it. Um, transportation fees are just where we get reimbursed for different transportation uh, trips. Uh, investment income, I really feel like interest rates will continue to be favorable in FY25. I feel like 3.9 million is a good estimate on our interest income or investment income. Rentals is just various miscellaneous rentals. It doesn't amount to a whole lot. It's, uh, this year we're tracking around 16 to 20,000. Um, federal indirect costs, why such a big decrease there is because of our ARPA funding. <clears throat> We've been able to charge an indirect cost rate to our ARPA funds and that won't be there in FY25. So the main two um, contributors to indirect cost are our Title I program and our special education program. So that's where the 425,000. Other local revenue is kind of a conglomeration. We get um, dividends back from GSBA on our insurance. We get uh, Foothills pays us for <clears throat> use of space. That's kind of where the other local revenue comes from and other various grant reimbursements we may get. Other state grants, this is where I put the school security grant. This may end up changing. This is just kind of where I put it for now, the 945,000. Um, <clears> impact aid, we get a small portion of impact aid for our students who, who live it under housing authority um, properties. We do get a little bit of money and that's where the impact aid comes from. It's a federal program. It's not funded real well at the federal level. So whatever we're eligible for, we're probably getting 20 to 30% of that amount. So, but we're getting, you know, and this is where we're kind of tracking this year is around 100,000. So. <clears throat> so you can see the, the net projected revenue is almost 232 million, about a $17.8 million increase, which looks good, but we haven't got to expenditures yet. So we'll, we'll get there shortly. <laughs> so it is good that we have that much of an increase. Unfortunately, on the expenditure side, we're increasing a little bit more than that uh, this year. <clears throat> So FY 2025 expenditures. So these are state mandated changes that we have no, no control over. They're set by the legislative body um, and by the governor. Salary increase for certified, we mentioned. There is a salary supplement of $1,000 for our custodians. Um, again, we will get funding for that and we'll, we'll pay that as a supplement to all of our custodians. Uh, they've done that the last couple of years. It's been nice that the governor's recognized the hard work that our custodians do so each and every day. Um, again, the increase in certified health insurance, increase in classified, and then the TRS match. Those are all changes on the expenditure side. <clears throat> so what are some of the initiatives we would, that we've put forth in the budget as a district that aren't state mandated? Uh, we would like to propose a salary increase for all classified employees of 1250 which is half of the 2500 of course. Um, we feel like in years past we've matched what certified got. We feel like for sustainability reasons, that's going to, if we continue to do that, it's just going to be harder from a sustainability standpoint moving forward. And, and you'll see later how much fund balance we projected that, you know, we may have to use for FY25. Um, we did but think Thank you all for approving the 403B match for our employees that are in the PCERS um, retirement system. Um, that retirement system, of course, does not have the robust contribution that TRS does. So the match has been very helpful. It's been well received. Um, we have the majority of our employees are actually participating in that. So any dollar, they, any percentage they put in, we're matching up to 6%. So the overall cost of that for the district is between four and 500,000, but it's, it, to me, it's money well spent for those employees <clears throat> and towards their retirement. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we do have a step increase proposed for all eligible employees as we have done in the past. Um, we are proposing some new positions. Almost all of these are touching students in some way. Um, five new teaching positions at CCSD Learning Center, <clears throat> a receptionist, a registrar, a part-time nurse and two custodial positions also at CCSD Learning Center, as well as creating a director for that. That director has been, <clears throat> we've always had a director for Classic City High School, but we have not had one for CCSD Learning Center. It was kind of, but they were in the same building and since now we're separating those out, we feel like there's, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the pollen is definitely, we feel like that um, <clears throat> we need to create that director position. Sorry about that. I knew that was going to happen. Um, we're also looking at starting a new program at our high school level. 
Um, and Dr. Scott can definitely speak to this probably better than I can. On the, the Center for Readiness, English and Career Education, it would be two teachers and one paraprofessional. Uh, Dr. Forker actually brought that program to our attention as something that you know, we feel like would be beneficial for our, our, <clears throat> our English learning students. Um, but if y'all have any questions on that later, I know Dr. Scott can definitely. Um, proposing four underarmed security positions, Clark Middle, Clark Central, Cedar Shoals, and also at CCSD Learning Center. I think back in, uh, in my months run together, December, January, we had a presentation from our maintenance department about adding additional positions for next year. That's what these five positions are, two, two HVAC technicians and then three general maintenance positions to kind of bolster the staff that uh, Dr. Askew and Mr. Bailey have to, to work with um, in plant services. <clears throat> An additional translator position, which is definitely needed based on the, the demographics and the requests we get at the district level each and every day. It is really challenging. Right now we currently have two translators and that it is, it is definitely challenging. Um, and then an IT analyst programmer position that can kind of do a good job of making our systems talk together better, um, just different pieces. Most of everything we use Munis, but we do have some ancillary products that you know, trying to, again, make those systems talk together a little bit easier. <clears throat> ARPA positions, this is where we, so due to the FTE growth we had that we mentioned earlier, that 1%, we did it. We were able to continue 12 and a half of those positions at the school level from a, oh, the, the rest of those we did not, you know, those positions, those employees are still with us. They were kind of absorbed into the school just through various, whether it be a, a vacancy or retirement. So I do want to point out, you know, those positions we didn't eliminate those. They just kind of were collapsed into the school level, <clears throat> but there are 12 and a half positions that we're going to continue in the general fund that were not there last year. Um, there's nine district level ARPA positions that we would like to continue or propose continuing in the general fund. <clears throat> two health center liaisons, two high school clinic aides, our two trauma informed specialists, um, an MTSS PBIS, and we talked about that last board meeting, you know, implementation specialist, a coordinator of our virtual programs, and then there's also a translator position that's also, that was funded by ARPA that we would like to continue in the general fund of those two positions that I mentioned earlier that we already currently have. <clears throat> so if you look at an expenditure comparison, I feel like this is the, the easiest way to break it down. We have salary benefits and then we have our operating budget. So FY24, our total budget is a little over 214 million. Our proposed budget is 236 million for next year. And we'll do a summary here shortly. Uh, salary benefits increasing about 19 million. Our operating is about 3.3 million. So a total increase of 22.2 million. And then I felt like the easiest way to do that was just break down salary and benefits and operating. So the health insurance increase we mentioned with classified and certified, that's a, an increase of roughly about four and a half million. Salary increase, the 2,500 plus the 1,250 is a, an expenditure increase of about 4.4 million. Again, we're getting some of that back to QBE. Step increase is roughly about 3.6 million. The change in TRS, a little over 2 million. The new positions I mentioned, um, about 1.7 million, that's salary and benefits. Um, ARPA school level positions, the 12 and a half positions I mentioned, that's about 1.2 million. Other net differences is mostly FICA and some other taxes that, you know, because of the increases in some of these items. That's the 765,000, um, and then we have the ARPA district wide positions is about a little over 680,000. So this makes up the salary and benefit difference. Next, you have the operating expenditures difference. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but I'll be happy as well as, you know, any executive cabinet to answer these. Um, a few I will point out. Um, our substitute cost has probably been under budget in the last several years. I feel like we always end up over budget on that. So I'm trying to, you know, beef that up a little bit this year. Liability insurance, I think last year we just didn't update that in the budget. It runs around 700,000. We had 515 budgeted last year. <clears throat> Um, Centegix, that's just the annual renewal on that, um, which we should be able to use the security grant or safety and security grant money to offset that. So that's a positive. Um, a lot of these are subscription based um, programs that we were paying for with ARPA funds that now we're having to move over 
into the general fund. We did try to go through and decide are there programs we want to continue or are there programs we want to discontinue. So that, that evaluation did happen. Um, and I know Dr. Scott and Dr. Hooker could definitely speak probably a better job on the instructional side with those. Um, fire alarm replacement at three of our schools, just some added, you know, just some needed um, upgrades. Intercon system, I think, is Cleveland Road and HB Stroud updating those systems. Uh, building automation controls, that's actually 10 facilities. Um, our shared services, I think Mr. Denson actually pointed this out when we approved that at the beginning of the year. We were short on the budget side of that, so we beefed up that budget this year. Um, I think other than that, I mean, if y'all, the international teacher fees are basically any legal fees um, and visa related fees. We have a couple law firms we work with. Um, we ask our schools if they wanted to continue that, and I think they've had a positive uh, impact the international teachers have, so I think that's something they wanted to continue. So we didn't really budget well for that last year, so we wanted to make sure we got that in the budget this year. We've kind of had to move some stuff around this year. <clears throat> Public impact is just a continuation of our opportunity culture that was approved during this fiscal year. Uh, it's just the, the annual cost of that. Um, Again, that was paid for out of ARPA in FY24. So, um, items for consideration. So this, most of these items stem from our February 29th input session that we have with, with the board or with y'all. Um, we did, I think Mr. Denson brought up paraprofessionals in elementary schools. I think the, the idea was one at each first grade class level. So we went back to our principals and said, what would really benefit y'all in the building at elementary school and they said they'd rather have just two additional pair of pros that they could just use somewhere in the building so and not necessarily it may end up being first grade but they just felt like they wanted the flexibility the projected cost of that is about 1.2 million uh, that's not included in the budget um, but we'll get to that point a little bit later communities and schools expansion th uh, thank y'all for your approval of that um, I think it was last month that we actually or two months ago we approved that that cost is included in the budget. That will give us an eight additional sites as well as a program manager. <laughs> not sure what happened to the lights there. I did not do that. <laughs> um, mental health counselors, we asked, I think this was brought up, maybe considering allotment for each high school. Uh, we had mental health counselors at the middle schools um, during ARPA funding. Um, we gave them the flexibility to choose. I think only Hillsman decided to keep that position. I think they consolidated or collapsed it at others, other middle schools. Um, at the high school level, again, that's not in the budget, but we left that as an item for consideration. Uh, reading interventionists, we have academic interventionists at each elementary school currently, so we think that kind of offsets that. Dr. Scott could definitely speak to that a little bit better if y'all have questions on that. Uh, restorative practices, we currently have a little over 260000 in the budget for restorative practices. Some of that is the hype contract y'all approved a few months ago. Some of it is also just around professional learning uh, development there as well. Um, deferred maintenance, I did not include anything this year. We did a million dollars last year. Um, we have spent about half of that. <clears throat> My recommendation if we decide to do deferred maintenance is to transfer that from the general fund and set up a local capital projects fund. What that gives is Dr. Askew the flexibility to not have to spend that money in that year so we can keep moving that. It's like a fund balance that creates. I've done that at other districts. It allows us to, if we have a project that's gonna span over a year, we don't have to worry about, oh, we gotta get it all spent this year so we can continue. It's just a separate fund. Um, you transfer the money over. You, uh, you can also transfer that money back if you ever need to back into the general fund if you decide not to. <clears throat> I didn't budget anything because we'll look at where we're at fund balance wise right now, but it's, it's definitely a consideration. And then our target fund balance. Again, this is a question of what we feel comfortable with, what y'all feel comfortable with. We're currently around 24 to 25%. Um, you'll see in a few minutes, we're gonna take a pretty good chunk out of that. And then it's how much lower do we wanna go to, to do some of the initiatives or some of these items that we've mentioned here. So. So I prepared some millage rate scenarios and then we'll get into a summary that kind of, so currently we're at 18.8 .8 mils. Um, if we want to drop that by 0.25 mils, based on the current projections of the 8% growth, it'd be about a $1.8 million hit to revenue. Um, 
again, I won't go through each item on the chart, but if you, you go all the way down to one mil, it's a little over $7 million, which I don't, I don't think where we're at fund balance wise, we want to consider that, you know, originally we were thinking maybe a quarter mil, but again, some of the expenditures, some of the increases have kind of driven up the use of fund balance. So that's just something that we got to consider moving in the next couple months as we start talking about the millage rate. <coughs> So where are we at currently? Um, projected beginning fund balance of around 55 million. Estimated revenues, 232 million. Estimated expenditures, a little over 236. So based on what we've projected without any of the items for consideration, we're looking at using about $4.3 million of fund balance to, to balance the budget. I will say, and a lot of districts haven't started this process or they're in the beginning of the process. A lot of districts are proposing using reserves this year to balance their budget. I don't think we would be alone in that category this year. Um, I think as ARPA funding has been used for different things, we've been able to build up a decent fund balance that now is the opportunity that we can take to use some of that fund balance to continue some initiatives in the district. If we, if we stay with the budget as is, we'd be at about 21.4% um, fund balance. <coughs> If you add in the items for consideration, I did all of them, it's about 4.1 million. If we do a quarter mill, or excuse me, a half, I guess that's supposed to be a quarter. I need to fix that. Um, lower the millage rate by a quarter mill. Apologize for that, I will fix that. That is the right number though, the 1.7 million. Um, so that's an additional 4 million. Um, so we would be using about eight and a half million of fund balance if we did all four of those. or. If there's other initiatives y'all would like to do outside of those, you know we can consider the cost of those as well. So that would leave us with a fund balance a little bit below 20. Um, I think when you start getting into below 20, some of the concerns are sustainability going forward. Um, there were several tax um, bills that were kind of bounced around the legislative session this year that we kind of kind of keep an eye on. I don't think anybody fully understands what the impact of those are yet. Um, I think we will have an option to opt out of some of those, but that's also, you know, another decision that would have to be made next year. <clears throat> so I think as, as decisions are made at the state level, we need to continue to kind of monitor that from our fund balance. We don't want to get it too low where we don't have room to sustain different, you know, different programs or different initiatives. So I think that's the concern there. Let's see. So next steps, and again, I, I hope y'all ask questions tonight of all of us. Um, so tonight was the budget, first budget presentation, kind of a training, kind of going through where we're at. Um, we'll continue to finalize the revenue. I don't really think the expenditure side from our level will be tweaked a whole lot, other than if y'all have suggestions, if we end up moving forward, we can do that. I think we're pretty good on the expenditure side as far as where we're at right now. Um, Revenue, definitely, we need property tax. We need a good number, and we also need a good QBE number. Um, hopefully, in the next week, we'll have QBE, and then by the end of the month, we'll have a good tax digest number. <clears throat> uh, we are going to provide y'all with a budget notebook, which will have a breakdown of all the operating expenditures. Um, y'all should have those by Friday of this week, and we will make, Ms. Palmer and I, we'll make sure we get those to y'all this week. So if we have to bring them to you, I will do that. Because so <laughs> we definitely don't, we don't want to inconvenience y'all. Um, we didn't quite have them ready tonight because we're still kind of tweaking a few things on the salary and benefit side, So, but we'll have those ready for you this week. We, that'll give you all a couple weeks to kind of go through all the operating. You'll have a complete description of all the operating expenses that are in the budget. Um, something I've been working on is setting up a ClearGov website, which we will have um, either May or June that will put our budget on our own our website that will go into ACC Gov is signed up with Clear Gov as well. So we, um, you know, we, a lot of county, I think we're the first school district in Georgia that's used Clear Gov, mostly county and city uh, governments have been using it. It'll allow us just to kind of have a public facing site where we can put our budget out there. It'll have it broken down by department. We can, it'll have the same detail you're seeing here, but you can click on different links and we can make it as accessible as pot, you know, Again, you'll get a PDF of that. It, it, we're still gonna do the budget notebook, but this is something we wanna kinda test this year and then moving forward, kinda do that as well. Um, I did FY24 in it and was, uh, it's, I think the budget ended up being like 178 pages time I got through with each department. Cause it does a sheet for each department. So I think it'll be helpful going forward. So that was something. Um, the cost of that was 12, 13,000, which I think is well spent. 
that Dr. Hooker allowed me to do that. I think that's, you know, I'm looking forward to getting that up and running. So, um, the next steps will be we'll present the tentative budget May 9th. So we'll, hopefully y'all have questions tonight. We'll take those into consideration the next two weeks. Any questions? Uh, Ms. Palmer has set up the question document like we had last year. Please put questions in there. We'll answer those. So we'll come back to you, probably a similar presentation, just with updated numbers. Um, and then June, we're looking at holding the two public uh, budget uh, hearings as well as the three millage rate hearings. We'll advertise in the paper. I think tentatively we're looking at, and again, this is, I think Ms. Palmer is going to send this out in the board update, June 3rd, 4th, and June 12th is kind of what we would like to. But we felt like if we gave y'all a couple months, that way if there's any conflicts, we can work around those um, ahead of time. And really nothing's set till we advertise those. Once we advertise that, then we're, then we're set. But, um, and then June 13th at the board meeting, work session slash board meeting, that's when we'll approve the final budget and the millage rate. And y'all are probably tired of me talking. <laughs> That, that's the presentation, but I'll, again, I hope y'all have questions. Um, if not tonight, because I know it's the first time y'all have seen it, you know, definitely reach out to me in the next couple of weeks and Dr. Hooker and Kathy. So. I, and I would like to say thank you, Mr. Groner, to you and your department and the cabinet for collaborating as well as our principals. This is very thorough. And I know uh, we listened to you last year concerning you wanted more information more transparency, as you can see, we've gone forth with the uh, gov. Clear gov. Clear gov, so that can be transparent to the, the public. We tried to take into consideration the things that you guys had suggested to us. Again, as Mr. Grounder says, we're waiting on what the governor will do in the signing of some things that may have additional impact on our budget. But uh, I, I think uh, President Anderson if you would like to open it up for questions from the board member. Okay, so thank you so much, Mr. Greiner. Um, I, yeah, I, I'd love to open up the floor for questions. I know this may be the first time we're seeing some questions. So uh, in the interest of just kind of fairness for everyone, I'm gonna start at the end and just kind of go down the line and give everyone the opportunity to ask a question. And then we will just continue with that format going back and forth until everyone's gotten their questions answered. And uh, yeah, so if you would like to start Dr. Gant. Sure, uh, and I'm still formulating and sort of processing a lot of, yeah, my thoughts and questions. I did have one with the mental health counselors at the high school. Um, those like that are listed under the items for consideration. What would what is the rationale of putting those under items for consideration as opposed to having them already embedded since they were, I think you mentioned they were funded by ARPA, right? I, I think at the middle school, and I'll maybe look to Dr. Scott for a little assistance on this one. At the middle school, we did have them. I don't think at the high, do we have them at the, I don't think we did at the high school. Okay. So this would just be an additional one to what they already have at the high school level. Gotcha. I think it got okay. brought up in our February 29th meeting, so that's kind of what we were trying to, uh, you know, encapsulate was all the thoughts y'all had from that meeting. Okay. So that's, that was. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Denson. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, and, and thank you, Mr. Griner, for uh, this presentation, this is, well done, I've, I've really been uh, appreciating the way our budget process has been going uh, this year. Um, so just uh, uh, four really quick questions here. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll put this one in, and the, it's in the questions because I, I doubt that you'd have it now, but I was curious of how much uh, money we spent out of the fund balance, how much we used the fund balance for to spend uh, unexpected expenditures like I know Rutland, I believe, was spent with. So I would like to, I would be curious of what that fund, and, and compared to other years, like did we spend out of the fund balance more than we do normally? Um, yes, sir. And um, 
And then uh, you actually already answered one of my questions of how much of the deferred maintenance uh, did we actually spend, and so about half. Um, so I would be curious on, on your recommendation of creating like a, a capital fund balance, which I think is, is, is a great idea. Um, would you be looking for us to this year or next year or something put in seed money for that to get that started? Um, because if so, I, I would definitely be um, on board with it. And I guess we could start maybe with the f leftover five hundred thousand dollars. And um, but I'd, be, I'd, I'd like to see just what your recommendations would be for for that. Okay. Um, and then the the last uh, two things are more just um, possible ideas. Just looking at you know the the second to last page where we have some of the potential expenditures in there. Um, I definitely do would like to see the the paraprofessionals and the mental health uh, counselors brought over. Um, and uh, I'm not as interested with the lowering the millage rate if we're actually going to use this fund balance, I think, in some of these really positive ways which are being proposed here. And two other ways that I guess I would like to throw out would be uh, potentially just thinking about creating like a sustainability capital fund that we can use for the, the sustainability committee's work, such as for grant matching and potentially seed funding for those things, which of course I think in years to come that sustainability work is actually gonna bring savings to us, but I know a lot of times we have to put money up front to get that started. And then the last thing is just, um, I know for classified employees, it was being proposed here that we give 50% uh, of what we're giving um, uh, teachers and such, and um, I guess, again, in lieu of not doing a millage rate decrease, maybe instead just going to, and doing a 75% increase instead of dropping that down to 50, because um, I, I definitely want to try to keep, you know, some equity going on there and not see uh, all of a sudden we have such a, a bigger divide growing between our classified employees. Um, and uh, yeah, I appreciate all this work. Unfortunately, I have to go. I have family that I've gotten in town for dinner, um, but I appreciate this and look forward to working with everybody on it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Denson. And I, I mean, the fund balance, we, um, Ru you're correct on Rutland. The purchase of that was not budgeted, but we um, thanks to that we actually got a midterm adjustment this year with some other uh, interest income was way under budget at almost 3.8 million. So I think we're actually going to end of the year either break even or we'll slightly increase fund balance. So that worked out well. And that was my first thought. We'd take the 500, whatever we don't spend between now and June 30th, we would start that local capital projects fund with that money. So, and then move for what we were doing in Glen County where I was at previously is we just, they had, every year they put a transfer amount in the budget and just stuck with it. And then they, they, they built that up to over 30 million, I think last time I looked at it. So it's, but I mean, again, they, it's just different digests and some other things. I don't think we can get there that quick, but I mean, a million dollars here or there, it would definitely build up pretty quick, so, yep. Dr. Yeager. Thank you. I'm just trying to make sure I'm clear on, for the items for consideration, some of them are already in the budget, so we're considering pulling them out of the budget, and some of them are not in the budget, and we're considering putting them into the budget. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, true? what okay. I, I tried to do, I'm sorry, I didn't point this out when I did the slide, Dr. Yeager, is uh, the ones that are, are highlighted are not currently in the budget. Um, okay, I can't see the highlights on my printout, and yeah, that one is I'm too sorry. far away. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's the, yeah, mm -hmm. it's the two additional para pros, the mental health counselors, and then there's nothing mm -hmm. for deferred maintenance. Those are the okay. three Okay, so those are the three that you're thinking that are about not putting in. in. Right. Um, we I currently do have the communities and schools expansion as yeah. well as restorative practices. And we well. voted for that already, right? Yes, ma'am, we did. And they actually, we received, um, they were applying for some state, national, federal funding, I believe, Dr. Hooker, and they actually received that, I believe, communities and schools um, recently. Yes, I just received word from Mr. Tim Johnson on yesterday that they were awarded the grant from the state for um, this, am I saying it right, CIS? Mm -hmm. Communities and schools, yes, CIS. Community and we got school grant. It, the state <laughs> awarded them that, which is great to help out, so. And, and so the things that are already in the budget, we're thinking about either adding to or pulling out, like we've already voted. I guess I'm curious why they're in this spreadsheet, or in this slide. 
the things um, we've already voted on that oh, we've already put I, in I'm the I'm sorry. Budget. The whole intent of the slide, I didn't do a very good job titling it. This, these were items y'all brought up during the February 29th um, okay. input session we had. Some of them we had already, like restorative practices was already in the budget when we met February 29th. Communities and schools was not, but y'all voted on it since. It was more to recap kind of the thoughts y'all had in that meeting. Um, and we may have, you know, we'll go back through, there may have been one or two items on there as well. We were just trying to keep, catch the main topics of that okay. meeting. Okay, so if there's some things that were in our heads that we didn't get out clearly enough to make onto this slide, we yes, should Yes, let me us. know okay. and we will consider that, yes. <laughs> okay. And either you could reach out to me or Dr. Hooker or through the uh, question sheet that Lisa has. I'm going to start checking that um, okay. on a daily basis. So if you ask a question, I will try to get back to you that day. And if the document you give us by Friday-ish is detailed enough, we can dive in and see. It, it won't. It's, it's when I was here in 20, it's the same notebook we prepared back then. So it'll have the operating expenses. You'll have line item by line item of the descriptions. So. Salary and benefits is a little bit more challenging because you you would end up with a, probably about a 500 page. So we kind of do a recap on that. But if, if y'all have questions specific on that, we can get you answers on that as well. But operating expenses, you will have a line item detail of each item that's and, in the budget. And since those are going to be like school by school, if I remember from 2020, they'll be grouped by school. Is that true? It's or not? actually, I think we used to do it that way. And now we, we changed it in 20 to do it by functional category. So you'll have all instruction together. You'll have all improvement of instruction. Okay. So that way, like with Dr. Scott has an instruction, improvement instruction, it kind of goes by the different cabinet or the functions that the state requires. Um, okay. Now it will have the school code. We'll give you the full account code and we can get you a list of if that's helpful. I guess I'm curious in terms of like a per student or per FTE uh, ratio as we look through those numbers. You know, I get a lot of questions about Cedar versus we, Clark uh, Central and I, I would love to be able to have the ability to say, well, look, we're giving them identical amounts of money per kid on whatever program it is. Yeah, or we can not. definitely, let me think through. <clears throat> clear, clear gov is actually set up that way. Okay. So you would go, but that won't be set up till probably May, June, because we got okay. to, um, I didn't really want to send them anything that we were close to finalizing, because then it's, then you start, you but it will it. be set up by like Clark Central Cedar Shoals. We can do that for you in the front of the notebook, a summary by every school, every location. That would be really helpful. It'll have the summary and then you'll have the detail by functional area. This, that's what we did in 2020 when yeah. I was here at 21. Okay. Um, and then if you need additional data, I do, we do not mind. I don't mind okay. pulling that at all. All right. I'll take a look at what you provide us and I'll ask yeah, any more questions. I mean, again, but that is, a, that is a very popular concern yeah. of which elementary is getting more money per kid than some other elementary and such. So, right. Yeah. And, and I can give you what we didn't do in 21 that I can definitely do now that you mentioned it. We can give you the FTE by school. That'd be great. Um, Thank you. I don't think we did. Uh, you had it by departments back then, like a summary page, but you didn't have the FTE count. But we can do that as of um, the October FTE count is probably the best one and it's by school and we can do that easily. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. I'm done. Okay. My turn. Ms. Davis. I have no questions. That's just not true. <laughs> okay. I was like, Ms. Davis, you got to have a question. I got to have a question. I have a, a good, I hope it's a simple question. So I'm um, just making sure that I understand the language that we're using here. Ms. Davis, do you mind speaking into the mic, please? Thank is that you. better? Yes, thank you so much. So the, the funds that came down, this is on the, the page with the QBE uh, formula, where, where the transportation, you're getting money, we're getting dollars for transportation. Is that money restricted in any way? No, no ma'am. That is the one, the state has never put any restrictions on our transportation. We just, okay. unfortunately, if, like I mentioned, we received about 1.3 million. Um, okay. So, but there are no restrictions on that at all. Um, it's, it's a funding formula they use. We get, I look today, our FY24 allotment, just to give you an idea, we get $13,000 per driver. Yeah. And they fund us at about 73 drivers. Um, Dr. Askey, you could probably, it, it, we, we have over 140 drivers. So they fund about half of our drivers and 13,000 does not fund. It's not a lot of money. Okay. Probably about half the, with salary and benefits, it's less than half of what we pay our drivers. Sounds good. The second question that I have is on the, uh, this, this is a line item under the impact aid. 
And you said that that money pretty much came from the housing authority or people, poor children that are living in public housing? Yes, ma'am. We have what, to. What um, accounts for that increase? Um, I don't think we've ever really budgeted. We've always budgeted that number pretty low. I'm kind of budgeting. And again, it's the, the timing of the way the federal government disperses that money. Mm -hmm. um, one, they don't fund it real well. Two, this is from previous experience where we had a working in a district that had a large Air Force base where we got three or $400,000. It's funded like four, you may get, we may be getting 21, 22 money right now. We're okay. not necessarily getting current money. That helps. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's kind of all over the place. I honestly didn't even realize we had impact aid. We, we did the application back. Your mic got turned off, Mr. Griner. Okay. Is that better? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't realize until we did the application in January why, because I was thinking, why do we receive that? But that's, right. that's the reason, just because of the housing part. All right, the next question is on the, um, the, the page where, you, where you're giving us the uh, 2020, 2025 CCSD initiatives and then the ARPA positions. So they're, you know, they printed out two on a page for me. So my question is, is there duplication between these two? When we say directly to ARPA, they're just being paid out of the, it's like a grant, they're, they're, they're paid out of that grant. Last year they were, yeah, it's some different funding source. Last year we were ARPA, this year we're going to bring that Your mic turned off again, Mr. Griner. Can you? He's so good. <laughs> we're going to go to plan B. Uh -huh. Thank you. Fantastic. So my count is 20 positions under the 2025 CCSD initiatives. That's new positions. And then I counted, um, I thought I had 21.5 under the ARPA, but I think it's going to be more like the 12.5. No, you're uh, right. 12 .5. It's 21.5. You're correct. So total 41 new positions into the, uh, don't see where, I can't tell if these are um, staff positions or if they are actually, you know, in the schools. Um, the majority of them, if you look at the ARPA positions, I'll just start there. The 12 and a half are definitely in the school. The nine okay. district, or more district-wide ARPA uh -huh. positions that kind of touch, you know, the entire district. So inevitably, yes, they do touch the schools, but they're not specifically located in the school. Um, well, I take that back. The health center liaisons and the high school clinic aides are. Mm -hmm. The other uh, five positions are not. They're district wide positions, so they're they're touching every school. Um, now, if you go back to the initiative page, yes. Um, the, the the first three lines are all CCSD learning center. Some of that is created because of expanding as we move into a new building, and I know Dr. Hooker, Dr. Scott can definitely address that probably. Um, much more eloquently than I, but that's that's what we're doing um, there. Uh, the new program at the high school is a completely new program, so that'll be working with our English learners. Um, unarmed security positions, I think we've kind of listened throughout the year and felt like that was definitely. Clark Middle, the main reason is that campus is growing. I mean, it's gonna be a, fortunately, it's gonna be a nice new school, but it's also gonna have a lot more square footage with the, I think that was the main concern there. Um, of course, Clark Central Cedar Shoals, and then of course the Learning Center again. Um, the maintenance was just out of a general, yeah, does that, that doesn't necessarily, those are the ones that aren't just working with students. Uh, ultimately, yes, they do touch because we don't want students in hot buildings. <laughs> okay, right. Um, uh, we can get past with that. Okay, so really good. Thank you so much. I think that's the end of my questions for today. Okay. Ms. Butts? Great job. Thank my question you. has already been answered. No further questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I do have just a couple of questions, if it's okay. Oh, Y'all don't sure. mind entertaining me for a second. Um, so you mentioned real quickly that there are some tax, state tax initiatives that have been proposed that we might have the opportunity to opt out of. Do you, can you give me like a quick little, like hey. what? I, I think everybody's kind of struggling with, they, they had an initial 
what they were trying to do is cap assessments at a 3%, like kind of a floating exemption. So your, your assessment couldn't go up any more than 3% per year. That bill got so manipulated, eh, not manipulated, that's a bad word, kind of watered down toward the end. I think GSBA is still trying to wrap their head around in GSSA exactly what is in that bill. Mm -hmm. um, originally what they were saying is that they would do the 3% cap, it would have to go on a referendum to the voters in November. If the voters approve, yeah, we want that exemption. Um, then we would, the local school districts would have to have hearings to opt out of that exemption. And you would have to, like millage rate hearings, you would have three hearings to say why it's gonna be detrimental to our school system to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of, it's so confusing. I think it's probably better to, well, hopefully over the summer, we'll get a little bit clearer picture from GSBA. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And they do, a, and GSSA both do a great job of explaining. So I was kind of, I kind of kept following it. And then at the end, it got kind of crazy with it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I will say in talking to Kurt Dunnigan at the Texas Social Office, I don't know if it's gonna have as much impact on us because we already have several exemptions in place in Clark County. Mm -hmm. So, but he didn't really go into a lot of detail, so we'd have to do a lot more research on that. But I think we already have some home f floating exemptions that would kind of, I don't think it would have as big an impact on us as, I know bigger, Henry Walton, they were projecting it was gonna have 10, $15 million difference in their tax digest, ultimately. So I think that's when it gets a little scary when we start looking at fund balance, if there's stuff like that, you know, down the, I, I do think the legislative body is going to continue to focus on property taxes because I think they they hear a lot from their constituents about millage rates. Um, mm -hmm. I do think the negative impact if they do end up passing something like that is districts are going to raise the millage rate. So, yeah. Okay. Um, there was talk about if they do that, the caps at 20 mills are going to have to increase the cap because a lot of districts are already at 20 mills. I mean, we just recently we went down from 20 mills. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. thank you so much for entertaining that. I was just wondering what yeah, potential sorry. impacts <laughs> those could have on the fund balance conversation that we're having. So I, yeah, just, and I, I think needed that's, a bigger um, picture. I knew when Dr. Hooker hired me, that was the question, like, I think what's my worry going forward? I think it was the, the fund balance, because right now districts are have large fund balances. But then as the ARPA positions get absorbed, which we have tried to do, our schools did a great job. We're not absorbing as much as other districts did, or we fill those with vacancies, retirements. Um, but I think that was one concern and then the tax digest starting to decline. Mm -hmm. um, eventually the real estate market just you can only get so much out of it, I think. And we're starting, I think things are, st or houses are still selling at Athens, but I don't think at the pace they once were. So, and mm -hmm. I know I knew from, prices definitely have not gone down, so. Yeah, so. okay, thank you so much. And just a couple other questions. Um, when the, the CCSD initiatives, I, I'm, I'm Understanding the CCSD Learning Center need, there's a new location, so it just needs to be staffed. Um, but the the CREASE uh, program, um, so some of the other initiatives, that one, and oh, the computer's frozen. I'm just wondering what the justification, has there has there been sort of data that's driving the decisions to hire new personnel for these particular things? Yes, and I'm gonna ask Dr. Scott to address that question. So when it comes to the CRESA program, this is for our newcomers. And when we're thinking about that program, then we have had a significantly large number of um, newcomers to our school district coming from other countries who are non-English speakers. So ideally that's what this, that's who this program serves, okay. would be those students um, who are in high school. So just our high school students only. When you're looking at that allotment though, it, then it's actually positions that we've earned. And okay. so we're not adding positions that have not been earned through QBE. We're taking some of the ESOL positions that were earned mm -hmm. and using those two. So those teachers would work specifically with those students from both of the high schools. Okay, thank you. And one initiative that, this, and this is my last question or statement. Um, one initiative that I didn't see was um, an increase in professional learning for our, especially our elementary age um, uh, instruct uh, teachers who just need that extra, I guess, support and understanding of when students 
are having disciplinary issues that are related to instruction versus disciplinary issues that are related to um, learning needs like SPED, et cetera, or disciplinary needs that are related to mental health. And I think that there's just sort of like a vacuum of especially early um, teachers in their early education who aren't able to um, identify those students early enough so that we can intervene and uh, provide additional programming for those students. I did not see that here at all, and I, I do feel like there is a need for that. So I just kind of wanted to mention that. <laughs> all right, um, do we want to go back around? Does anyone else have any questions, or should, do you, would you all? Yes, Dr. Gant. Um, yeah, I have a couple more. Um, with the Learning Center, where it has the five teaching positions and the receptionists, I'm guessing the registrar and receptionist, they would be a part of the Learning Center um, right. as well. Yes. Um, um, Sorry. So are these, would those positions are they also new? I know they're listed under new. I, well, my, my question is, how many positions do we, how many teachers do we have at the Learning Center currently? If I'm correct, we have four position, teaching positions at the Learning Center. The additional positions we are asking for is the middle school. Currently, those four, uh, how many? Sorry. We do have four core teachers, and we have two special education teachers. Okay. Currently, and it's serving both high school and middle school. Okay. And with because of the, the rotation, 9 to whatever, 9 to 12, and then 1 to 3 for our middle schools currently. So next year, in order to for both uh, grade levels to be there, we need to hire additional staff to service the middle school's students as well. Okay. And they have a... Um how many students do we have at the Learning Center currently? So what I understand you to be saying, we have four teachers and two special, uh, education. Yes, special education teachers. How many current students do we serve? Uh, my last take, I think we have close to 75 students that are there. Okay. And, and am I correct in saying that, Dr. Scott? Are you looking that up? Yes, so currently it looks like there are 57 middle schoolers and but this isn't going to be the most current because some of those students have transitioned back to their high, their school and 90 high schoolers. So again, the CCSD Learning Center, it fluctuates depending upon the disciplinary hearing and how long they were assigned there. So it, the numbers fluctuate throughout the year, but I do know that we've had well over 100 at some points in times throughout the year. And so the goal of these positions would be so that basically they can be separate. Correct. They can have the groups of students can have their needs, like middle schools can have, middle schoolers can have teachers, high schoolers can have teachers. Yes, because yes. currently the content staff has to cover middle and high school content. And they're only, the students are only able to attend half day because of that, mm -hmm. but by having middle school content teachers and high school content teachers, those students can be there all day, and then it also relieves some of that load from the teachers. Okay. That they're not having to try to cover six through 12. Gotcha, and will they have a, will they use, um, I don't know if they even still use this, but will it be like a supplemental online instruction? Yes. Still, so or will these teachers be given direct it will be uh, more of a blended model because right. I know that was a big push for the teachers this year mm -hmm. is that in order to increase student engagement, then they didn't want them just sitting on the computers doing ingenuity right. the entire time. And so there's been a lot of PL, a lot of support from our curriculum content coordinators around helping them through a blended model of some direct instruction and support for students, but also the use of ingenuity. Okay, and currently right now there is not, I think Dr. Hooker, you mentioned that there was one, a counselor, right, at the Learning Center, but yes. there, there is no one, like a mental health counselor or a, 
Or did you say it was a social worker that was there, that was assigned to that school There is no, counselor? there is a counselor? Mm -hmm. there okay, is a that will go with the, CC, the learning CCS center. Learning Center? Yes. Okay. okay, okay. I'm sorry, I was wrong. I gave you misinformation, I apologize. No, I think you said counselor, I just got it confused. If it was okay. a social worker or, so that pretty much is their support, their emotional support is the counselor that is placed there. The counselor, and then there are two behavior interventionists yeah. that are placed there. All right, any other questions? Yes, Ms. Davis. So the Learning Center is now my new favorite topic. So um, can we get the, is it appropriate for us to have the total cost of the build out staffing and operation of the Learning Center? And is it an innovative improvement or is it more strategic? in terms of its existence and where we're going with that. It, um, I apologize, I'm getting old and I can't hear out of this right ear. So you say, is it more innovative? Yeah, is it an innovation or is it more of a strategic direction? I think we're being more innovative in how we're approaching educating our students at the CCSD Learning Center compared to what we're doing now. And That's we've great. listened to the teachers, uh, several of them. We met with them last week, but I believe Dr. Blankenship has had meetings with their, well, it was, C, it was Classic City, LSGT, but meetings with the teachers on how we can improve that. So we're listening to the teachers on how to better improve that and improve the rigor and the engagement of students. So do we have some performance indicators for this new move? Are there particular targets that we're trying to achieve and seeing an outcome for the children going into this new environment? Because it's a beautiful building. It's very attractive, and we've not ever used that kind of facility for uh, this particular population. So what do we have in mind of knowing how effective this move is? We'll be glad to go ahead. So that's one of the beauties of having an opportunity to truly separate it because we really do want to make sure that we're providing students with a well-rounded experience that not only ensures that they have an opportunity to think through what is it that happened that created the, the situation where they are at the learning center, but helping them to really look at how can I change that so that I'm not having to come back. And so that's a big part of why we wanted to make sure they were there all day. And one of the positions that we're adding is a resource teacher who would provide them with opportunities to engage in various um, forms of fine arts, such as music and arts in STEM, so that they are having an opportunity through more of a therapeutic type setting to really think through and look at how we can remediate some of these behaviors and mm -hmm. determine some replacement behaviors. So those are some of the innovations that we're working with the new director, Dr. Talbert, to really think about how we can implement some things to support students around what their needs are for their social and emotional needs. So that when they're going back to their school, then they're going back with strategy. This is excellent. And so we will be tracking them once they go back and it would be awesome if we could have you know, uh, some good data as a result of this move. Um, yes. Year over year, that would be fantastic. We will be asking that they complete an improvement plan just like our other schools and programs. Great, thank you. All right, um, I'm assuming Ms. Butts, you did not have any other questions. I just had one last final question and it was very easy. The, res the um, opportunity culture line item, I thought we already approved that and it was coming out of this year's budget, not next year's budget, because that's 95,000 that is, has been added to the FY25 budget. And my understanding was that when we approved the 95,000, it wasn't gonna be a repeat, like it was a one-time payment. I'm not, I'm gonna look at Dr. Blake. I know it's in the budget, maybe it shouldn't have been. We'll look at that. I, I'm, yeah. I'm on the same page as you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think we have any other expenses around that, so I, we'll, we'll take a look at that okay. and get an answer for you. All right. yeah, okay. If we could take that out, I'd be, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> an extra 100000 to play around with. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Um, that is all that I, yes, Ms. Davis. I'm sorry, I, 
I'm trying to remember about the deferred maintenance plan, and I didn't want Dr. Ask you to feel like he wasn't uh, loved. So how are we doing on that with this budget? Are we going to reduce that amount of money that was out there? Was it something like $9 million in de deferred maintenance? What does this budget do for us in that regard? Um, right, right now, there's no, there's no, Ms. Davis, there's no money in there for deferred maintenance for next year, but that's something we need to consider. Uh, we put it, um, y'all voted to put a million in last year. We've used about 500,000 of that, and I can let Dr. ask you. We are doing like the HVAC replacements, we're doing that through SPLICE, so we're trying to figure out how to best maneuver the different funding sources we have. So that was very helpful that, you know, uh, we were able to do those through SPLICE, but I don't know if Dr. Ask that would like to add. As Mr. Griner said, we spent probably a half a million. Um, we've been really judicious and conservative um, with the use of the funds. You know, as you know, um, we've got many facilities in Clark County, and it's very similar to make an analogy um, to the way you manage your home. There's always something you can do at your house, right? It's the same way in the school district. There's tons of projects, um, and again, many things for many years that have not been attended to um, that this will give us the opportunity to address. Okay, and uh, just as a reminder, we do have that questions document um, out there. Ms. Palmer shared it with us earlier today. And so between now and when we are meeting next to have this conversation, we have plenty of opportunity to continue to engage the district and ask the questions that will help us make an informed decision. And with that said, um, I think we're comfortable going ahead and moving to item five on our agenda, which is to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Second. All right, that move is made by Ms. Davis, seconded by Dr. Gant, and we are adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.